Colleagues, we've come now to a very important part of our night, the James Larkin Thirst for Justice Award. This award acknowledges the work of somebody from outside the Labour Party who has campaigned for justice and whose values reflect the type of just society that the Labour Party wants. The award is named after James Larkin, a man who, in the words of Christy Moore, was a mighty man with a mighty tongue, a voice for labour, a voice for justice. The people we have honoured with this award in the past have all had mighty voices and mighty tongues. Last year's recipient, Jack O'Connor, who is sitting here, who has consistently campaigned for the rights of workers during these testing times and continues to do so. Or the posthumous award to Susie Long, whose campaign for better health services and cancer treatment continues to this day over six years after her death. We have also honoured those who have highlighted causes of abuse and the rights of victims. Both Colm O'Gorman and Mary Raftery were previous recipients. It is in this tradition, colleagues, it is in this tradition that we are making this very special award tonight. Because last autumn, a young woman from Belfast courageously spoke out about the abuse she had suffered by the IRA when she was in school preparing for her exams. She recounted the cruel kangaroo court where her abuser denied the allegations and how she had justice denied. First when the IRA investigation failed to reach any conclusions and then again years later when her legal case ended without resolution. She spoke of the trauma she had experienced since and the devastating effect it has had on her life, not least having to see her abuser live and work in the community. Colleagues, she had the bravery to speak out. She had the bravery to challenge her abuser and those who covered it up. She has also been to the fore in encouraging others and other victims to have the courage to come forward, tell their story, and seek justice, which they truly deserve. Tonight, the Labour Party is honouring her for her determination, for her courage, and her single-mindedness to continue her, her campaign. Conference, I now truly ask you to stand and acknowledge the recipient of this year's Labour Party Jim Larkin Thirst for Justice Award, Maria Cahill. Thank you so much. I'm honoured and deeply humbled by this award, which I would like to accept not on my behalf, but on behalf of every single person who has been abused and who is suffering the cancer of suffocation of not being able to tell anyone about their own experiences. If this is you, do it, because it is in breaking the silence that things start to change for the better. I'd like to thank Joan Burton, Alan Kelly, Mary Moran, Ronan Farron, Liz McManus, Angie, the entire Parliamentary Labour Party and activists for the support which I have received from you all. It does mean a great deal to me. The last few months have been deeply traumatic for me and your kindness towards me made everything a little bit easier. I'm also deeply grateful to Jennifer O'Leary, Chris Thornton and the rest of the BBC NI Spotlight team for giving me a voice that was kept silent for years but which I was finally able to use in October. 
and I'm grateful to them for dealing with the issue in a sensitive way and for treating me with respect. Their programme, which won a prestigious Royal Television Society Award two weeks ago, was the catalyst for the months which followed and the forcing of Sinn Féin to admit the wider issue of the movement of suspected sex abusers around this country. Sinn Féin would never have admitted this had it not been for Spotlight and the subsequent media interest and the help of others along the way. They have still not answered any of the questions which Spotlight put to them, not one. And they denied me my experiences and sought to discredit me. And I will not allow them to do this. I suffered horrendous treatment at the hands of the IRA in Sinn Féin and I'm entitled to speak out about what happened to me and I will not be silenced because it is politically inconvenient for some. <laughs> Let me tell you what it feels like to be scared. I remember the first fingers laid on me and what that felt like. My childhood wiped in a split second. I remember the fright the confusion, being too afraid to open my eyes as the IRA man got a sick kick out of using me like a ragdoll, not being able to scream out loud, screaming inside my head instead, keeping my eyes shut in the hope that he would go away, feeling the pain, digging my fingernails secretly into my skin so that I could flip my head somewhere else, wanting to be sick, feeling owned, the smells, disgust, shame fear. It took many years for me to realise that I wasn't to blame. The responsibility for my abuse lies with my abuser. The responsibility for an illegal investigation which culminated in making me face my abuser lies with the IRA. And the responsibility for the cover-up and the continued cover-up of my abuse lies with Sinn Féin. It was not and it is not my fault. And these are messages which I still need to hear at times, and I'm so grateful to my family, to my cousin Ailish O'Hannon, to the Sunday Independent and Diane Harris, Regina Doherty, Michal Martin, and Enda Kenny also, and the many, many well-wishers who have helped me along the way. I tried to obtain justice for myself in a court, and I was badly let down. I will probably never get over the fact that my abuser, Martin Morris, is now free, and will never be held accountable for his gross violation of not only me as a child, but as other victims also. Justice was ultimately denied to me. I had to endure four years from the point of complaint to trial, and it took its toll. Then, when I waived my lifetime right to anonymity to tell my experiences, I was subject to some of the most vile abuse imaginable, in an effort to frighten me into silence. Every aspect of my life was scrutinised, from my weight to my dress. I was told that I deserved to be raped, that I was a lying psycho bitch, an evil woman, that I enticed my rapist with my virginity and was involved in a clandestine affair. Graffiti was spray painted on the walls of West Belfast where I live. And this orchestrated campaign of vilification in order to save Sinn Féin's neck on the issue was not condemned once by Jerry Adams despite being repeatedly publicly asked to do so. Non-condemnation creates the conditions for it to continue and it's a very dangerous message to send to any victim of abuse. Open your mouth and we will attack you. Keep your mouth shut or this is the collective treatment which you will receive. Well, I think that's a despicable way to treat any human being and I will not allow any other victim of abuse to be further abused in this manner. But my journey isn't over. I will continue to do everything in my power to help highlight the situation and to try and protect children from further harm. When I did the Spotlight programme, I was convinced that I would be killed for disclosing, and had it been a few years earlier, I probably would have been. And in many ways, the public nature of my case has afforded me some form of protection. But I don't regret waving my anonymity for one second, not one. It was the right thing to do. And if my disclosure has helped even one person out there, then it will have been worth it. There is nothing to be gained from living your life in the shadow of silence. The Dublin Rape Crisis Centre have confirmed that every time that my case is raised publicly, calls to their centre increases as more victims reach out to get help. That can only be a good thing. 
Finally, I want to leave you with my experience with Joan Burton, who I think is a hugely impressive woman. When I first met Joan, I almost nearly talked her to death, and my words came tumbling out because I wanted to get across to her how what had happened to me had affected me, and how I needed the parties to highlight the issue because more children were potentially at risk. And Joan said three words to me which made all the difference. I believe you. That can be one of the most important things that you can say to anybody who has suffered from abuse, and it helped. And I spent my first Christmas and New Year this year in 18 years, a little bit lighter for having disclosed. On New Year's Eve, for the first time in a long time, I felt settled. And I received a very deeply touching and thoughtful message from Antonistia, telling me that she was thinking of me and she wished me a peaceful New Year. And I could never put into words to Joan Burton just how much that meant. And these are the things which people don't see away from the cameras. So the allegations of being used as a political football are simply not true. Joan Burton supported me because she knew that it was the right thing to do on a human level, and I want to thank her for that. And during the Doyle debate, she directly addressed me while speaking to Gerry Adams. She quoted a few lines from Maya Angelou, whose name Gerry Adams had sullied when he cynically used a few lines which most people would find inappropriate in the middle of a sex abuse scandal. But I'd like to reclaim Maya Angelou tonight and quote those words back to Joan and to you and to every single victim of abuse out there and I want them to take you to take them with you in the coming months ahead. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Gormila Magov. Thank you.